preparing to live stream the meeting. And I'm Got refreshing it. YouTube on my end. Okay. This meeting is being live streamed. Got it. Got it. Hey. Meeting is now streaming live on YouTube. Sweet. We are up. Okay. It, it looks like it's going to flip between the two. Yeah. We, we can ask the ask the audience if they want us to have it flip back or if they want us to come up with a standard view. Let's see. What would that be? Standard gallery. View. Maybe. Gallery. Yeah, yeah. Like that. So. All right. People on the internet, let us know if this uh, sounds good, if it looks good. And uh, if, I don't know if there's any other questions. Uh, let me post in Discord at everyone. We're live. Okay, cool. Hey, there we and go. I can see the chat. I, I'm Sweet. learning a little bit every time. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let's see here. Um, immersive. I wonder what that is. Choose immersive view. That doesn't sound like what I want to do. No. No, that's not it. View, speaker gallery, immersive. I wonder if we just, there's a way to pause it. Hide self view. Hide non video participants. Full screen, speaker. Well, anyways, the, those of you that are on uh, on YouTube that are starting to tune in, uh, usually what we do when we start a live stream is we just kind of talk about the things that are going on in our world. Uh, we did that a little bit this morning. Um, I Sound good. Says it sound good. Sweet. Yep. Uh, people on the chat, let us know if you can hear both uh, both participants and let us know what view you want. Do you want speaker view or not? <laughs> um, all right. So, uh, Adam, what's going on in your world? What's the what's the, what's the latest in the Adam makes beer? either YouTube channel or uh, your, your, your professional life or anything? Yeah. Uh, good question. Just, just busy, man. Um, just, uh, just trying to honestly, just trying to put out a bunch of content and uh, trying to reach out to folks, uh, do stuff like this, which is, which is a lot of fun. And I'm really excited about it. It's been, I don't know. It's, it's been a, it, it's been a fun ride doing this stuff over the last, uh, I started in May, um, uh, releasing, uh, material. So, so that's cool. Um, as far as work, um, just, uh, a lot of times just brewing, brewing new beers right now. Uh, the brewery I work for was acquired, uh, by, uh, by Saucy Brew Works out of Cleveland, uh, okay. December one of 2022. And so we're, we're, uh, I'm piloting a bunch of different beers for what are going to be, uh, different year round releases that are going to be in cans, stuff like that. So, yeah. Very cool. How was that process getting, uh, getting acquired and shifting ownership? I mean, it's, it's, it's the first time it's happened, uh, for me. Um, and it's a lot. You know what I mean? Especially with somebody, you know, it, it's not like they're in the same city, you know, they're three and a half, four hours away. And so, uh, you know, there, there's remote meetings and texts and team messages and, and everything like that. And just everything that goes to, you know, to putting two operating businesses together, uh, which is not a, which is not a small feat. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, well, to, today's, um, I, I just looked over at the, at the, um, the delayed screen right there where the, where the chat is. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, is he talking again? And then uh, we got the live stream <laughs> of the delayed screen. All right. I know what I'm doing now. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, today's topic is going to be uh, talking about thialized yeast. I'm sure that's something that you've obviously, you know, seen floating around the industry uh, in Spokane where sure. we are, we've gotten a lot of breweries that are really enjoying it, not just for, you know, the new flavor compounds and the, and the newness of it, like a lot of home brewers are, but also for the cost saving, uh, you know, measures. So uh, I don't know. You want to you want to just jump in by breaking down, uh, starting a conversation with uh, about what thiols are, why, where we get them from, and why thialized yeasts are kind of cool. Yeah, and so uh, I, I sometimes I, I joke around and and I'm a, and I'm a little serious. What, what I tend to do when it comes to certain scientific topics, uh, I give uh, I give a um, the, the dumb guys uh, practical advice mm -hmm. or, or or explanation of what's happening one. because that one. because that's how <laughs> because that's how things work for me um i'm not somebody that's that's super sharp on um the the, the super nitty-gritty of all the different compounds going on uh with hops um but essentially what we're talking about when we're talking about uh thiols thiols are uh, compounds that are uh, that are perceptible at very low levels. You, you don't need to bowl somebody over. You don't have to have a, a massive volume of thiols in a beer in order to uh, have them have them be perceptible. 
And so um, some different yeast manufacturers, and, and they've been doing it with a, w in, in a couple of different ways, but uh, Omega has been doing some work where they do some, they do some gene editing with this yeast. And what it does is it kind of unlocks the yeast potential to allow these, th to unlock these thiols and kind of let them shine. It's mm -hmm. a fascinating thing because the, these thiols mm -hmm. can uh, be coming from anything from hops, um, but they can be coming from base grain as well, um, mm. from the malts that we're using. So, so that's kind of another exciting, exciting little wrinkle. Um, generally, they express in in kind of a grapefruit, guava, uh, passion fruit uh, scent. Um, and obviously, that stuff plays in very well with um, you know uh, IPA that's popular today. Um, yeah, absolutely. And yeah, just just kind of a just kind of a little nutshell on that. Yeah, so uh, thiol, I mean, the, the thiolized yeast, the, the whole, you know, CRISPR-Cas gene editing stuff that Omega's been doing has kind of been really fun. But also, uh, I feel like on their website, if you go to their website, they've done a pretty good job of kind of like laying out their journey on, hey, we we started looking into this, and then this is what we tried, and then this is kind of where we're at right now. Um, so it's, sure. it's cool to see the, you know, from their perspective, like, you know, hey, they're still learning too, but it's kind of, you know, the fun part of the science. That's the, that's the back end stuff that I really like. Yeah, and two, kind of the other interesting thing too is if you if if you have read uh, New IPA by Scott Janish or, or follow his blog, I, I feel like calling his blog a blog is a little bit of a is a little bit of an insult. Um, it's he 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 he's really publishing, you know, essentially scholarly, you know, journal worthy yeah. papers and and research, and it's it's been cool to watch him kind of chase some of this too because he he was trying to uh, do some work on uh, on on this whole thiol thing before with with blending different yeast strains, specifically yeast, uh, pardon me, specifically wine strains uh, mm -hmm. that that are known for having some of this capacity. So it, it's it's kind of cool to see to to kind of read his stuff and the progress with that and then ultimately with these thialized yeast being released and things like that yeah, it, I haven't, I haven't it's really all it's all new you know absolutely yeah uh, and now we got companies that are also coming back coming out with uh you know like the what's it called phantasm which i can't really tell yeah. if that's just like a wine tannin powder or like what it is but like just things that are going to have more precursors and i'm sure sure the longer we get around we're probably going to start realizing that you know not only does malt have it, not only does wine tan have it, but there's probably a bunch of other things that we have access to already that, you know, we can use to build those precursors. And um, I don't know, I, I haven't done too many, too many experiments, right, so far, but uh, I think uh, whether or not the extra, extra, extra precursors uh, are, are valuable is going to be <laughs> something to be, you know, to, to be talked about because there's plenty of them that's already naturally in, in malt. So, you know, when do you need sure. them? Sure. Sure. And, and and I I know that even I, I think Berkeley Yeast Labs is I think they even have like like a liquid precursor uh -huh. that they sell. So like you can you get like Phantasm, but you can also be adding like the this liquid precursor uh in fermenter when you're pitching yeast. So yeah, there's even different ways of uh, of doing some of that stuff too. So That'll be cool. Yeah. I, I, I'm going to have to do some side by side by side by sides, um, especially, you know, with <laughs> split batches and seeing what, what works and what's not necessary from the practical sense. Sure. Sure. Well, and, and that's kind of, I, I just did a, I did a sit down with, uh, with a, a brewer buddy of mine, uh, Chris Neff. He brews up at storm cloud brewing in Michigan. And, and he's done a lot of, he's done a lot of work with those strains and, you know, uh, not not to jump the gun too much, but I think that the idea is a lot of times like wh whether it's homebrewers or pros, I, I think we all do it. We, we, we get something new and then we just want to smash it like we just yeah. want to use as much of it as we can. And, and, and it's going to be inter interesting to see how this this whole topic um, of the thiolized strains, pushing thiols, all, all these various various ways to attack it, where that's ultimately going to end up settling out. You know, right. it, it, it's something long term that we use with nuance, so or is it something that we carry a heavy hammer with? You know. Yeah, exactly. Is it going to be the next? You know, a haze, hazy everything? Or, you know, is going to be have some variation sure. of thiolized, or is it going to be something that we kind of just be like, all right, yeah, it's a good tool to have in the toolkit. Uh, I, right now, yeah. actually, Warren's getting ready to make a. Uh, cold, cold IPA, IPA. Yeah, yeah, a cold IPA, and I'm just going nice. to call out um, as I was hanging at a tea shop after this morning and stuff. I was actually watching a bunch of your uh, little clips from that live stream about the different uh -huh. thialized that you had broken up, and I felt there was a lot of 
cool information in there. So I appreciate you actually breaking it out of the live stream to have those little clips there as well. Sweet man, no, that, that's, our, that's, that's, the, that's the brewer here that's making the thigh. Hey guys, how's it going? Hey Warren. Hey, so yeah, I'm using uh, the what, lager one. Yeah, I'm using the Luna Crush by Omega. Yeah. Wise, although I didn't have as much as I thought I did for a starter. So I'm also adding some some Voss and some cable car and some DIPA. Sure. So I just kind of found some yeah. random, uh, random expired yeast, which I've been exclusive. Have you brewed with, with have you brewed with thialized uh, strains before? I have not. So with this one, I'm gonna do a first wort hop as suggested nice. by Peter to kind of really draw out those thials. Is that that's what we're talking about, right? Yeah. yeah no, <laughs> What's a thial? <laughs> thial is a sulfur yeah. compound. <laughs> uh, it's a sulfur compound. Yeah. It's intensely aromatic and it's got a flavor threshold that's relatively low. And it um, changes. So there's free right? thials, which yeah, yeah. So basically there's free thials and then there's precursor thials. And then the, the free thials are the ones that um we're talking about that you can actually smell that has the passion fruit and guava uh, and the precursor thials are locked up. So you can't, you can't sense them. Um, and so what you're looking for, and this kind of goes into, there's a question from uh, breeze buzz. He says he can't get the omega strains over in Australia. Um, but you're looking for basically yeast that have the biotransformative property of expressing beta lyase. That's an enzyme that unlocks the thials from the precursor uh, thials. And yeah, I know yeah. philosophy a couple months back, um, I think it was probably the brew lab. Uh, they had a couple episodes and they actually talked about like enzymes helping with that process as well. Mm, beta lyase yeah. is an enzyme. Yeah. Um, yep, and definitely. Uh, brew buzz, I'm pretty sure it's Thule. <laughs> oh, is it? Yeah. What up, Thule? Hey. As our Australian friend. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, I'm going to hand this back over to Peter. I'm going to go mill some grain and measure some hops and do it overnight match. Heck yeah, man. Enjoy. <laughs> I just needed an excuse to get some beer. <laughs> no, for sure. <laughs> but no, yeah, that's that's kind of the idea. What what I'm doing with those is um, it, it it's good. I, I the the brewer that we're talking about before, Chris, that's been working with these strains. It's um, he 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 worked with me in the industry when 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 he first got in, and it's just been cool to see. He's got a lot of flexibility, so they have they have a big system, but then they also have maybe it's a roughly two barrel, maybe it's a one barrel, but they can turn, they can turn a lot of different things off there. They're, they're really precise. Um, they, they do things in a scientific way. So it, it's always fun when you can talk to somebody that's, that's, you know, gotten into those things quite a bit uh, and, right. and has a, and has something to work with, you know. What size system do you work on at your brewery? At the brewery that you I brew on a 15, a uh, 15 barrel system. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, so that's a I think that's a good intermediate size. Like you, you're, you're still probably burning yeah. through those batches semi quickly. So, definitely, uh, definitely. Uh, ours here is a is a two barrel, um, but it's like a janky homebrew built two barrel, and we uh we got rid of our, our seven barrel system uh, like a little over a year ago. So we haven't brewed anything other than small okay. batches actually. Okay, I saw you guys brewing on that uh, the other day. The when you were doing a two barrel batch, absolutely. Yeah, and I saw yeah. how you had a rig between different things. That's one of the things that it's since I stopped home brewing, technology has has uh, elevated uh, yeah. quite a bit, uh, quite yeah. a bit. So it, it's cool. It, it's cool to see different things uh, in action and everything like that. Yeah, ours basically ends up being like it's just giant home brewing at this point in time, but with a really nice fermenter. Sure. Uh, but yeah, we're, we're yeah. just yeah. hands around and it's it, it works for us. The whole system we got for I don't know we probably have less than ten thousand dollars into all the brewing stuff here, so. For beautiful, you know, being commercial, you know, brewery, it's a uh, definitely was the a cost efficient way to start out. Sure, yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah. Um, so we, well, let's see, we, we talked about what did we talk about already? The just kind of a brief explanation of what thialized is and right. that, and like the compounds and stuff. Um, I guess my first big question is, is do you feel that there are other styles that could benefit from these stylized yeast strands that other than IPAs? Because I know that M Omega mostly markets their stuff for IPAs and stuff, but yeah. is there well, other the Mexican, styles? The, the Mexican one, the star party that uh, Warren's using, I think that one is might, a, might've been swords, you know, like a light, you know, Italian style Pilsner, like a yeah. hoppy lager or something like that. 
Yeah, I, I think so. And I, I, I drank, uh, I, I've had a couple of beers um, that were done with the with the thialized lager strain. And, and, and it's nice, man, you know, and, and everybody is going to have people have different feelings about this. I know sometimes if you get that, if you dial up that passion fruit note, um, you know, people have different preference levels for that. Um, yeah. and, and also, you know, and also remembering, uh, you know, these compounds um, kind of have uh, a, a sulfur base to them. And so um, sulfur can be an issue um, mm -hmm. with some of these. And there, there's some there's some people that you'll hear. They'll say, I brewed with them. Everything I brewed smells like farts. I'm never touching it again. Yeah. Um, so, you know, yeah, um, I've been I've been fortunate enough that that when I've been using them, I haven't run into that, but, but I do think it is a fine line though, too. Um, yeah. I, I think you can, that, that is something to look out for when using these strains. Yeah. I think other, I mean, other than that, I think it naturally lends into a lager world and there's certainly lagers that I think I appreciate at least a small amount of sulfur in them. Um, yep. I don't know. I, I haven't looked into the science of like how to really avoid um, overly sulfurizing them. And also when you, uh, when you unlock that, uh, um, that fart smell uh usually yeah. <laughs> my 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 way to get rid of that would be you know uh, rousing or getting co2 to kind of scrub through but that would also eliminate some of the aromatic compounds that you're going for so i don't know do you know sure. anything about the the solution there yeah and i i know some guys i like so for for some of the old dudes that i would talk to in the industry they would just always talk about getting some copper in contact with a beer that yeah. has uh that that has some sulfur in it it, it can break down. It can age out. You can blow it off. You can strip it out. Um, I, I've been in that situation before where I had a beer that I, I needed to get out by a date. Um, and uh, for some reason, when it was in fermenter, when I was sampling in fermenter, even crash, I wasn't pulling. I wasn't pulling the sulfur on it. And then I got it over to bright and I got it into a glass and I'm like, oh no, it was, yeah, it, it, it was stinky. And so you, you just start stripping it. You, you know what I mean? You're, you're kind of yeah. in that spot where you're like, how much sulfur can I strip out of this thing? Right. Um, but for me primarily, so um, issues that I've had with sulfur have uh, a little bit in lagers, but again, like, like you mentioned, it, it is kind of, you know, on, on a low level, there, there is some expectation there. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, uh, also, and, and I don't know about the two of you, but sometimes when, when I run some heft strains, I can get, I can get some sulfur off of those. Um, and I'm just finger crossing right now. My, uh, my, my run with, uh, thialized strains that I haven't really had anything with that yet. Is there a copper naturally in your system? Uh, anywhere that's going to, you know, be, you know, be the, the solution there? The uh, no, there, there, there isn't naturally. No, not within anything that I had. So I would have to look at, uh, doing something, uh, doing something else. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, I, this also isn't something that I thought about before. If, uh, if you know the answer to it, but does, would copper affect the thiols at all? Or is it just, uh, just free sulfur that it kind of takes care of? It's a super good question. I, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. And, and I, what was, I'm trying to remember one of the things that I was listening to today that that I thought was interesting is um, I was listening to an interview with uh, Dr. Laura Burns, um, and and it kind of does speak to how how new these things are. I think it's it's kind of it's kind of emerging stuff, right? Because yeah. some of the stuff that was so one of the things that stuck out for me from for an interview today, she was talking about that like more aggressive fermentations will actually blow this stuff off. Right. So like she was saying, like, if you're looking to maximize the, that thiol expression, you know, potentially dialing back the temperatures a little bit and different things. So, but yeah, yeah there's keeping under pressure and all that for sure. And that would actually kind of uh, answer a little bit of beer coordination's question. Would a Krausen lager fare any better on the odor and stuff? And you kind of mentioned it might blow off some of those thialized things that we're looking for. Right. Yeah, I, uh, I'm not sure. It's yeah, it's still new. Even even on Omega's uh, um, site, where they're kind of going over their process in terms of making the the four. I think now that they have, yeah. um, they yep. they're still saying, "Hey, it's brand new," and we're still trying to figure out. Like they don't even try to express beta lyase anymore as their primary uh, enzyme. I think there's a different enzyme that they're trying to attack. That's actually it's, it's found in like bacteria that's on your skin or something like that. 
Um, but yeah, crazy. they're they're very candid about how it's a how it's a new science and how we're figuring a lot of things out. So, like you said earlier, I'm kind of curious to see where this lands in a year and then in five years if it ends up being commonplace. Well, yeah, because everybody thinks it's going to be like, I, I mean, kind of the, the last two things that were super huge were, I mean, there's obviously hazy IPA, but on the ingredient side, you know, citra or mosaic. Mm -hmm. And I think all hop growers are always trying to drop the next thing that's going to be the next one of those. Um, right. And yeah, and I, and I think that's kind of the, that's kind of the question right now is, you know, how long is the, is the thylarized thing going to stick, mm -hmm. you know, because, because I, I think there's room for it. Um, I mean, yeah. as anything, it's 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 just a tool. You know what I mean? And so to, to look at, were you reading the question from Skyman? Uh, yeah, um, I, I was going to get to that one. The here do all thialized strains. Okay. Because he says, do all thialized strains produce uh, the same esters? So it, it theoretically, so like depending on what they're what they're working with, a, a lot of those, the, a lot of the IPA ones are essentially London three. Um, yeah. that that have that have that tweak so you sh you should still be pulling a london three character off of that but then just with varying levels of this thiol expression based off of any number of variables right and uh, with the ones that uh, uh you omega is kind of built they're trying to give you a lot of the same expression as whatever the parent strain is and so they've got the, the london three that, that's that's their british five isn't it the london three yeah um, uh yeah the, i think so then they've got the chico and uh now they've got the mexican lager that they turned into it so uh, they do have different ester expressions i guess is a short way to um to answer sky man's but it's it's based on the parent strains uh, uh sure. and the, yeah, the thiol production um or just better probably worded the thiol expression the thiol releasing is a different mm -hmm. function than everything else in the yeast metabolism yep yep and uh, Jimmy, to answer your question, we haven't mentioned doing any split batches here. I think that um, Single Hill did. Mm. Um, I think uh, one of our local home brewers down there picked up a couple of those beers, brought them back, and I tried them with Rachel oh, nice. a while back. But I think they were experimenting specifically with the different um, Omega strands. To be able to do a uh, you know a parent and a and a kid version of you know you've got the for example. Um, star party and uh, the mexican lagers do a side by side with the same batch that you just split up uh that's i think something fun that anybody by the way in spokane if they want to come and use our stuff and do i'd love to not have to do that work but get all the answers <laughs> yeah i mean that's the good i mean that's the work that needs to be done right and it's exactly. like um uh and that's kind of like my thought I, i'm i'm hoping to do a batch soon that just kind of utilizes well specifically i i want to do one that that's really just leaning on mash hopping um yeah. I, not not for overall balance but in my mind it's one of those things where you, you kind of want to hit each different variable of the process and see what what it gets you in the final product you know right, what i yeah. mean um so i mean j just from a knowledge standpoint that that's kind of how i would like to proceed with it but yeah yeah, and uh, are you using using it yet as like a as like a crutch to be able to use less hops? Because I know there's a couple of local breweries who no longer dry, just kind of try to methylize yeast, and they're using a lot less hops overall. Uh, is that something you play around with, or is a is a priority for you at all, or not really? Okay, so I, I want I also want to know what your opinion on that is. So, do you feel as if you can do that? Um, I feel like, like I've had beers that are really good that are done like that, but I uh -huh. would be afraid to, you know, say immediately that I can just, you know, not dry hop, for example, because um, I do sometimes sure. rely on that for, you know, a nice aromatic. But I also have made great, you know, flavorful aromatic beers that don't have dry hops in it. They just rely on a really heavy whirlpool sure. hop. So maybe that's the way to go. Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, I mean um i have not uh, how i have used it so far is is i, I essentially took our what's kind of like our, our our house ipa beer called sabo um and i essentially kept the recipe the same just swapped out the yeast and and, and rebrewed it um that was i mean th there's a noticeable difference in 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 my mind and for me it does express as passion fruit with the with the with the base recipe uh as it was and then I did another IPA, which I think would kind of be a, a good example of a little bit more scaled back approach. Um, and mm -hmm. I have that in the fermenter and I'm going to be going over to bright with that this week. So it, it, it's a it's a little bit early, um, but I'll be interested to see how, how that comes out. 
Yeah, that'll be a good kind of side by side experiment. Yeah, I know that it's definitely exciting to I mean, hops, especially right now, are more and more and more expensive. And so, you know, if you get sure. to something like an eye where you're putting in, you know, dozens of pounds of hops, being able to scale some of that back is uh, definitely attractive. But uh, again, I sure. think it might end up falling into the camp of it. Just makes a different beer, maybe not necessarily a comparable beer, but something that's different. Yeah, and, and I think so. And and I I wouldn't I I, well, I, I I'll say this. I, I would be surprised. Um, I don't think uh, this would be a hunch. I don't think you should go into using this strain and thinking that what you're going to be pulling from the thiols is going to express explicitly the same way that dry hop character does. Right. Now, I, I think what it will do is it, it will bring that passion fruit, that guava, sometimes that grapefruit. Um, but there's other things going on with that dry hop, as we know, right? There's obviously the polyphenol contribution. Um, mm -hmm. There is some green, you know what I mean? That there's there's other things. It's just not a, a straight line element of whatever fruit the hop is, you know, wh whatever fruit impression the hop is giving, right? So, right. But yeah, that that kind of be my thought on it. Yeah, I think it, as in my mind, I, I definitely agree with you. But I also think we're the trend we're seeing in beer and what people are going for in beer right now is it's towards you know almost less flavor so i think a lot of times uh i think people in the beer industry or beer drinkers are actually going towards i want something lighter more sessionable i don't necessarily want a total oil bomb you know it's sure. not how much hop oils sure. my tongue these days and so i think this might be something that leads us into kind of the next direction that we're going to see the ipa take where something that's like the cold ipa which is a terrible name but a you know a fine style <laughs> Um, I think, yeah. uh, I think that's going to be maybe something that's kind of led by this, this whole, you know, thiol, uh, research and trend that we're seeing. Yeah, I, I, I think it's, I, I think it's super possible. Um, and, and like you said, I mean, people, people are looking for things that are, that are more approachable. I think ultimately, um, that's what hazy IPA is. Hazy IPA is more approachable IPA. You know, I, I don't know what what IPA was like out by out by you guys, but you know when when Hazy came out and I was in Michigan, um, you know breweries were still slamming you know ninety IBU into a beer and it was it was bitter as hell, yeah. um, and uh, you know a, a little bit of a challenge, especially for a guy like me to get through. But then the softer, rounder IPAs started hitting and kind of just enough bitterness to balance and. Uh, yeah, it, it, I think it is an expression of that uh, of that demand for for more approachable. Or, or just kind of might be off topic a little bit, but are, are you guys seeing an increase of lager out by you? Um, yes, yeah, a uh, pretty strong trend actually. But also in our area and just in the Pacific Northwest in general, we we do like more bitter. All of our beers are just naturally more bitter. We're, right. we're very braggadocious about that you live in the hop capital of the world. I, I distinctly sure. remember traveling and being like, this tastes like a pale ale, like and yeah. having IPAs in other parts of the country and being like, this is like a Northwest elf to me. I think Spokane, yeah. so Spokane's where we are in Spokane. I kind of like to say that Spokane's about four or five years behind, you know, you know, big cities like Portland and Seattle and stuff sure. like that when it comes to like the next round of beer trends. But um, I think Spokane, we're starting to see that same lighter beer kind of shift. And we're st starting to see a lot more lagers and light beers pop mm -hmm. up and people asking for them in the craft beer, you know, world. Definitely. Definitely. Is it the same about where you are? Are you starting to see some more? Yeah, I think so. Um, I mean, my spot is a little, our spot is a little, uh, is, is a little different. It, 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 it's a little bit different demographic. So I'm outside Cincinnati. And if you go downtown, I mean, you see, you, you see kind of what you would expect, you know, a, a lot of IPA is on tap, um, stuff like that. But uh, we're about 30 minutes outside of Cincinnati. And, you know, four of my top six, seven beers are lager. Uh, nice. And that's just because we we just we we're just going to brew what people wanted to be drinking. You know what I mean? And so yeah. I, I started pushing on the lager side a little bit more. And I'm like, well, OK, so we have a Hellas and we have a Pils. Well, you know, can I try a Mexican lager? And so and then that became our number one seller. You know, of course, nice. light beer. People drink light beer. But um, but yeah, so but but that's a that, that's a bit of a demographic thing. I mean, it, it might be a bit of a blip, but but there are some other breweries near us that uh 50 West, a brewery, d distributing brewery near us. I think they're going to be potentially doing some more distro in, into cans on the lager side. So as far as I'm concerned, I, I'm all for it. 
Yeah. In terms of what I want to drink, I'm going to probably, if I go to a brewery and visit them, I'm going to judge them by the lager. It's going to be one of the first things I order. Oh, yeah. Uh, but also just yeah. in general, like if I'm going to, if I'm going to be drinking, you know, for the drinking purpose, I'm probably going to go with the lager anyway, just because it's something that's nice and uh, uh, light and there's enough quality to it that it's something that I can appreciate, but also I'm not going to lay myself on the floor in four or five beers. You know? That's the truth. <laughs> I forget. Yeah. I was listening to I was listening to an episode of uh, Craft Beer and Brewing, and they were, they were talking to a, a Hellas brewer from somewhere, um, and he was saying, you know, like at, at some point you should hope the person across from you is more interesting than your beer. Um, yeah. And yeah, I mean, I, I, you, you can hear that on some level. Like sometimes, sometimes it's great to be able to sit down and and, and really nerd out and, and and break down a beer and things like that with your people. But sometimes it's just good to you know spend time with yeah. your people too. Exactly. No, hundred percent. I've, uh, I, 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 I think went through a lot of the same kind of life cycle that a lot of craft beer drinkers go into. Like you get excited about craft beer, you start learning about craft beer and you go way onto the nerdy side and everything has to be kind of that, uh, you know, slight, have that slight pretension to it. And then, you know, the sure. more and more and more I live in the beer world and beer, you know, it's constantly surrounding me. The more I'm like, you know what, sometimes I got to just be able to turn my brain off and you just drink without tasting. Sure. Sure. Yeah. So I was going to say, I was just thinking, um, you mentioned mash hopping. Do you guys not do like give your, uh, or, uh, your grain to like any farmers for like cattle feed or any farm animal feeds or and stuff? That's a good question. We do, but yeah, but we have not mash hopped yet. Okay. Um, so yeah. Well, yeah. do you have a strategy with the, cause one, that's one of the things that, you know, reasons that we're kind of on the year that Warren's brewing, he's going to be going with the, trying to do a first war hop or some sort of dip hopping method. Um, yeah. The reason we've gone away from the the mash shopping is strictly because we are hoping to give our grains to animals, and that's not good for them. Uh, do you have a strategy Absolutely. for that? Or is that just... Yeah, I need to talk to I, I need to talk to my guy. I, I don't have uh, I, I don't have the mash hops uh, beer on the calendar yet, but I'm gonna have to talk to my farmer and uh, and figure some things out just so he knows uh, yes, potentially yeah. what's coming. So yeah, or if he can help me figure out what I can be doing with that stuff. Yeah, I do know a lot. Of, there are a handful of farmers that are like, I'm either going to give this to cows or I'm going to compost it. I do have one of the farmers that takes this. Like he has that option too. So maybe that's the, maybe that's the route he goes sure. and just he takes it. But sure. No, no, that makes sense. That's a good question. Yep. Uh, any, any chat questions that we've uh, um, asked? I, I was just going to comment, uh, Easton, uh, just kind of Daniel mentioned his uh, no hop Sierra Nevada pale ale uh, they sent us. Um, uh using uh terpenes and stuff and i was going to pick us up uh, you up a bottle of just sierra nevada pale ale so you can do a side by side no nice yeah get That'd you and warren to do a side by side there and then uh which led east and beast to mention that he thinks the next big thing craft beer is a no hop brute pale ale okay uh i mean i think that's probably just using the beast being used in the beast, the beast but yeah uh <laughs> Uh, no, I, I actually I have really enjoyed playing with terpenes. I, I, I reached out to uh, um, Trent Musho, uh, the brew show dude, and uh, asked him if he wanted to do a collab at some point in time using terpenes. But terpenes have been like kind of my favorite, uh, my favorite way to to oomph up some some beers without necessarily having to play the whole hop game. I don't know. Have you, have you played with terpenes at all? I, I, I bet. Yeah, no, I, I haven't. I, I think that's really interesting. At, at what point in the process are you looking at adding stuff like that? Uh, usually I do it uh, either late bright or I do it when going into the keg. And so if I'll make a, I'll make like a single hop, you know, pale ale or something like that. And then what I'll do is I'll, I'll put different terpene blends into different kegs. Um, sure. Just to, you know, that way I have kind of like a terpene series and people can kind of get used to, yeah. Hey, I'm going to come in when this one's done. I'm going to try a new terpene blend, but uh, yeah, no, it's been really fun. How how do they express in general? Do, do you feel as if they, they, exp um, do you feel as if it expresses uh, as as a beer that uh, was treated with traditional hops, they can. They definitely can. There are cer certain tripping blends that are designed to kind of mimic hops, and there's other ones that really aren't. They're designed to kind of have a, a different, unique flavor. Um, but if you if you if you were to completely substitute hops for terpenes, I think you would notice. Um, and it wouldn't uh -huh. be the same, uh, but if you made something like a pale ale and then just turned it into the IPA flavor range with terpenes, I think that you probably wouldn't notice because they can they can definitely you know play that role that makes sense that makes sense yeah and and then uh brewing bad mentioned that he brewed a batch uh with lunar crush mash hop boil aroma flavor and dry hop as well as adding phantasm and he's like it was a bit much on the flavor 
And I can see just <laughs> him listing all that. I was like, yeah. that's just too much. Yeah. I mean, precursor wise, <laughs> there's already a ton of precursors. And so, yeah, I don't, I'm almost uh, wondering the efficacy of Phantasm. I think that'd probably be part of my side by side. And they'd probably have to try to do it with three different beers. One would just be the normal recipe with the normal yeast, normal recipe with the thialized yeast, normal recipe with the mm-hmm. thialized yeast and the Phantasm powder or something like that to see where the, but at what point is it really, you know, needed or, you know, are, is the job taken care of, you know, just on the halfway point or something like that? Sure, sure. That makes a lot of sense. And, yeah. and then uh, getting back to the terpenes, uh, Brewing Bad also asks, has anyone used uh, Spectrum yet? Is it available for home brewers? Spectrum, that's the new, is that the new Barth Haas uh, thing? I think so. I don't, have you used I Spectrum? I think so, yeah. I have not, no. That is the, the, the furthest I've gone... As far as anything semi-advanced hot product is is cryo stuff, I've not gotten into a- any of the the whirlpool oils or anything like that yet. Yeah, we've played around with some of the oils. I uh, I don't know if I fully like them yet or not. I do get their their use again for the same kind of reason of just not having to lose beer to hop absorption and stuff like that. So for sure for that sake, I, I I like the idea of it more than I actually like using those. But I haven't I haven't played with those too much. Well, and I, I guess big picture, you know, um, one of the things that one of the things that those things can be useful for um, and, you know, we, you can have the conversation of absolutely, you know, just trying to make the thiol bomb. Um, and as was mentioned before, uh, w- with all those w- with all those different type of products, um, one of those key elements is, is if you are trying to, to, to push that stuff a lot, you do want to be pulling, you do want to be pulling the green out of your, out of your process. So yeah. a lot of times they'll talk about, they'll talk about, you know, you can do whirlpool hopping, you can do dry hopping, but probably not as aggressively as, right. as you would have potentially with some of the other things, because they'll actually talk about green matter actually helping to, to, to strip or subdue, uh, that thiol expression. So it's, it's, it's kind of a balancing act too. It's kind of a balancing right. act. Yeah. That's a part of it that I actually hadn't heard about, heard about before. Uh, do you know any of the back end of how the green matter strips and thiols or is it just just something that's known, but not, you know, not science. Yet. Yeah. And so one of the, um, I was looking at a couple of different things and one that I, one article that I really love on this was the, the locksmith article that was on, um, that was on the Scott Janish website. The other one was escarpment has a great article. Es- escarpment East labs has a great article on, on using these and I'm forgetting, and I'm forgetting the mechanism, uh, at play there. Um, but yeah, in, in, in general, um, that, that is what's happening. And so th- there is a, there is a difference with, because y- you could say, well, if I'm throwing a bunch of green matter into the mash, mm-hmm. um, what d- does that affect in the same way? And it doesn't. Right. Um, because the mash is going to filter it. Yeah. And the, the mash is, the, the mash is going to filter it, but it, but it also has to do with, um, with, with some of the processes at play. Um, but yeah, I would definitely dig into those two articles for, for some of, uh, s- some of the, some of the nitty gritty on stuff like that. Interesting. Yeah. That'd be super, I'd be, I'd be super interested to see what the, that's about. My, my screen is not a touch screen. Oh. Well, cause they were saying, cause they're, they were even saying like that they were finding that, um, that beers where they were giving like more aggressive whirlpool uh, additions to that they were that they were losing um, they were losing like twenty percent of thiol expression and different oh, things like that. It, it's it's kind of wild. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's something that I, I don't know. I, I don't know if it's necessarily. It, it's not intuitive to me because that's not. Again, that's not typically the, the the chemistry side stuff that that my brain leaps to. Um, but yeah, there, there there's some cool stuff out there on it. Yeah, I'd be super curious about and that. And then I'm just going to make a quick shout out. Uh, since I started watching you this afternoon to now, you're out at over 3,000 subscribers on your YouTube channel. Oh, sweet, man. Awesome. awesome. I just was like, I'm going to check that because I know that when you were on the Hoppy Hour, I was that that was a big push was to try to get you to 3,000. Uh, if mm. anybody's in the chat right now, or if you're watching, you know, not live when this is posted after the fact, then uh, go over to Adam Makes Beer uh, and, and, and give him a subscribe if you haven't already. Yep. And then um, uh, uh, Thule actually asked, is there much hop creep with these thialized yeast when dry hopping? I know if uh, something like Voss, if you dry hop anywhere above two to three Celsius, uh, it becomes grass clippings. And I don't know what that conversion is. 
So a uh, hop creep is a, that's an interesting one. Um, and that is something that happens when yeast kind of re-kicks back up and starts to ferment beer uh, because the glycosidic linkage is, is, is what is the, is the, is that beta lice that breaks those two things apart? Or is that the other? Bio I'm not part? sure what that is, but functionally that's what's happening. Yeah. You, you're having, you're having long chain sugars broken back down, mm -hmm. uh, broken into, in, in, into, into smaller chain, reigniting, reigniting that fermentation process. Um, I have only seen, so uh, I have some different stuff going on. So up until, up until recently, I've been doing uh, essentially only cold side dry hopping. So right. when, when I say cold side, it's probably not the best way to say it, but uh, a soft crash to 58. Um, right. And then I'm pulling, I, I'm harvesting yeast, then dumping yeast, uh, and then dry hopping at, at 58 degrees. Um, all that stuff is just stuff from uh, new IPA with Scott Janish again. Um, and uh, so that's how I have been dry hopping. Now I will say at the same time, I'm also not sending out my IPA to sit on store shelves warm. Right. Um, I'm not. I'm. I'm not doing that either. I know my stuff is being poured in my pub and in draft accounts. Um, so it's not something I'm not super concerned about that process. Um, I have been doing some more fermentation dry hop lately, right. and uh, that that'll that'll give me hop creep every time. I've, I've got to drop, I, I have to drop the original gravity and all those beers that I'm fermentation dry hopping with because, because it goes past spec. You know what I mean? And I mean, yeah. at, at this point, at, at this point, it's all, it's all pilot stuff anyway. So it's it's not right. like I'm missing out on something going into a can, but yeah. 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 That's i uh, I've only, it's been a while since I've gotten any hop creeper in any of mine, but I, and I also all, uh, almost always do a bio transformation or like fermentation side dry hopping. Yep. Um, that said, yep. I, I feel like I just, I, 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 for whatever reason, don't like a lot of yeasts that do, wouldn't do naturally produced to acetal, like as part of their uh, fermentation. So I think I'm just lucky more so with yeast selection than anything else. Um, and that's why I haven't gotten yeah. it, but yep. Yeah. Um, my wife says, cheers, dears. Uh, my anniversary is coming up by the way, and I'll have been married for eight years, which is a, a fun milestone. For hey, me. Congratulations, man. That's awesome. Yeah, thank yeah. You. <laughs> um, uh, breeze buzz is there. Uh, oh, that's the thing we just, uh, we just answered. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Stephen Plass, I don't know if you were trying to do a super chat, but if you were, it did not come through. Oh, no, he's a Will of Beer Fund donator. That's the oh. PayPal link below. So thank okay. you so much. Appreciate oh, it. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, I know that uh, Warren has uh, volunteered uh, Jess to do a Will at Beer. Oh, nice. Yeah. Challenge. Challenge. Uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, Thule says that, that he really, that answer really did help him. Oh, nice. On that. Nice. So. And I'm glad that did. Yeah. Uh, there was something I was going to ask when we were talking about the green matter uh, it's, it's, uh, with dry hopping specifically, but I forgot what it was. Something to do with the effect of getting actually like that green matter, that you know, that plantiness in your final beer. Uh, is that something that you're sensitive to when it comes to hazies? Because there's a lot of hazies that I just end up not liking because I feel like I can taste too much of that grass, grassiness. Yeah. And, and, and that's, that's another one of those things, right. Where, um, and it kind of, it kind of also, uh, overlaps, uh, not, not saying that it's the same thing, but you, you can also kind of have that conversation of hot burn, mm -hmm. uh, and, and they're in there too, a little bit. Right. Um, and, uh, yeah. And for, for anybody that's listening that that's not quite familiar, sometimes like with, with, especially with heavy, heavily high, heavily dry hopped, um, hot forward beers, you can kind of get like, um, it's definitely a balancing factor, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's not, it's not real bitterness, but it's definitely a balancing. Um, but it, just like it says, maybe a hot burn, like something kind of a, a little bit hottish there on that side. Um, something maybe even like, uh, a little bit like grippy on the tannic side, mm -hmm. um, some stuff like that, some, some unpleasant things. And then on, on and kind of also lumping in there a little bit, like with the grassiness and whatnot. Um, yeah, I, I think, uh, a lot of times those beers, if, if you are really going after it on the dry hop side that they do peak, um, sometimes a, a little bit after they're on tap. Uh, depending yeah. on depending on when when and uh, when and how quickly you, you need to get them on, um, but no, I I think it's uh you know yeah it, it's definitely definitely a real issue definitely yeah. a real issue. I know a couple and I, and I do know so, I, I do know some guys are will even um I I do know to kind of to deal with some of that stuff um there are um 
I know, I know guys do use uh, biofine even in stuff that they want to be hazy, potentially at yeah. lower levels, but they feel as if it can drop some of that out a little bit, pull some of that, some of that green uh, rougher character out, um, but still not, still not drop your haze. Um, yeah. and, and even on like on the centrifuge side too, I, I know some guys that are centrifuging, but it, it's, it's just a real, it's just a real gentle thing. You're not looking to pull everything out, obviously. Right. Yeah. I didn't, I, yeah, I've never even thought about centrifuge. Yeah, I've, I've always thought about a centrifuge being all or nothing, not like a, ah, just a little. Centrifuge. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, 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 it's interesting. Yeah. Ju just a little bit to take some of that, some of that burn out of it, man. Yeah. yeah because, and, and, and I, and I don't know what, and I don't know what, what, what you guys have done in the past, but you know, I mean, if, if you're putting, you know, four, sometimes six pounds per barrel of something in there, I mean, you're going to, you're going to have some stuff. You're, you're going to have yeah, some, it's gonna, it's some, pellet, it. some pellet character is going to be coming through. Yep. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I think we try to, as a general, we do try to kind of err on the, on the lighter side and try to get uh, flavor and aroma from everywhere else, just because that's something that I personally have been sensitive to. Um, but that's kind of sure. where our exploration into uh, into terpenes came from and then you know our exploration and a lot of other kind of alternatives uh ways to yeah, it make, makes a lot so, of sense um that's why uh, that's, yeah, that's what led us into that sure are, are the terpenes expensive like are are you is, is there any savings using those terpenes uh compared uh, I to think a, so. a more yeah, robust they're, dry they're, they're definitely not as expensive as hops you know per the amount of flavor you get um i don't think it's they're they're, they're definitely not cheap for what they are uh i want to say sure. a half uh you know half barrel keg worth costs somewhere between 50 and hundred dollars, depending on how heavily flavored you want it to go. Um, but sure. in terms of what you would spend on hops to get the same kind of impact, uh, you know, I, I think that's, it's probably cost equitable. But they're also supposed to be very shelf stable, correct though? Is, is or, or, or am I, okay. We get, and I think there's, there's one of those, there's one of those other, uh, one of those other advantages for somebody that's packaging, you know, and throwing stuff on shelves or even if you're, you know, even if you're making beer at home and you don't want your hot flavor dropping out, you yeah. know, um, because, because it does. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the funny stories about how I started thinking about terpenes in the first place was, uh, so we're also a homebrew supply store. So we're a small brewery and a homebrew supply store here. Mm -hmm. And, uh, there's a lot of interesting characters that come in and buy products for whatever reason. And sure. uh, there's this dude that's like definitely like high school dropout kind of vibes, but he ended up uh, in Washington. We became legal. I don't know how many years ago, um, but he opened yeah. up a, a dispensary in Spokane and his like post high school, like dig into science became the science of terpenes and like all the marijuana terpenes that he can use. Sure. To yeah, yeah. The stuff that he makes. So he, t yeah. he talked to me for like, I don't know, two hours one day about everything he's been learning about terpenes. And I'm like, you know, not necessarily a light bulb moment, but like, I feel like that's what made me start thinking I should try those in, in some beer. Sure. Um, was, sure. Yeah, funny. And, and that's, that's the other thing, man. All this stuff is so, it's still so emerging. I remember I, I was talking with, I was talking with the, with the PhD uh, yeast guy from, uh, from Imperial. This is just at a, at a conference. Mm -hmm. And you, we we were talking about we are talking about sulfur in a finished beer how where when why and everything and even he was saying like th there's certain there there's certain things that are going on 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 some of these pathways as far as the sulfur and, and he says we we still don't have hashed out and that stuff blows me away you know what yeah. I mean and, and I I think we're in this really interesting time where like when you think about it like technology wise the super majority of people that are making beer, we're not using anything that hasn't been used for a very long time. We're using heat. We're using pressure. We are using yeah. pump. Sure. But like it, when you start getting into people that are using like internal calandrias and stuff like that, okay, maybe, but like, we're still, it's still a very, it's still a very basic process of what uh -huh. is happening, but now we have well, we have all these ingredients that we already had, but then new ingredient after new ingredient. And I, and I feel like there's just this huge glut of new things to be using and almost yeah. not enough time to figure out what the hell you can be doing with them, you know? Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. Well, cause even like when, when I, cause, cause I never, I, I didn't really, I, I really didn't make like the, the, the hazy style that much um, before, before coming here. 
And I just ran London three and I would talk to other brewers and like, well, when are you going to do something other than London three? And I'm like, dude, there's so many things I need to do other processes yeah, yeah, yeah. that I need to do with this strain. Like I just need to keep using it for right now because yeah. there's all these other things, you know, and, and I still haven't gotten to them, you know? Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. I think that's one of the interesting things about, about beer right now is that there's, there's so much new stuff and even old stuff that we can't even, we can't even figure it all out yet because, uh, yeah, anyhow. I'd probably make the comment at least, I mean, as a homebrew supply store owner, I'd probably make the comment at least once a year that I just want them to stop making new hops. <laughs> I don't want to have to carry all that. <laughs> well, and then you make me and Jimmy very sad. <laughs> That's true. Uh, everyone, everybody wants it, but I'm like, I've got like a hundred plus different kinds of hops. I don't need any more. Uh, yeah. Sure. I, I was... <laughs> I was going to say, getting back to some questions, and I'm going to combine both of uh, Daniel's questions. Um, Let me get a beer. Uh, can you get me a root beer? Mm -hmm. um, uh, what are your opinions on using thiols and saying different, like a tropical stout? Um, he's personally tried it in a CDA with a big mash hop um, that didn't end up with good thiol expression and stuff using cosmic uh, punch. And then he also mentioned or mixed firm uh, thiolized sours. Um, or, and I'm going to add kettle sour. To that, do you feel like those might be styles that might help express the thialized or showcase that, or or at least good uses for it? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, uh, and and he's hitting on, a, on on a few different things. So so he's talking about you know yeast blending um, because yeast blending is, is one of the ways that um, that you can kind of dial up and down that thiol expression as well as on the ingredient side. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's actually the, I, I personally think this is one of the cool uses looking at this overall, because I think it's really easy to think IPA with this. And then the next thing is like, well, okay, well, and, and I was talking about this with, with, with my, with my new boss, it's like, well, okay, well, let, let's start taking some IPA techniques, but then using them explicitly for fruit beers, right. Or for, for something else. Um, and then, so th this, this, this concept right here of the, the tropical stuff though, I like that. And, and yeah, I mean, to me, to me, that's interesting. And if, if I were going to run something like that right off the top, um, I think I would probably, if, if you want to try a blend, I, I would go with, um, I, I would go with one of the less aggressive because there's cosmic punch, which definitely does a thing. Um, but then there is uh helio gazer, which to me is, is, is quite a bit more expressive. I would start with maybe something not as expressive, um, and then kind of see, see what you get from there because that, that tropical stout can have some of that, some of that estuary, some of that estuary English profile, right? So, so why not throw something that has a little different nuance on top of it? I, I don't think that's, that's a place for a thial bomb, but yeah, to me that that's a place to feather something in for some nuance and, and whether or not a, a group of judges would, would be, you know, say stylistically check. I, if, if, if that's your thing, that's great. But if you just want to have something, uh, do something fun and, and color outside of the lines a little bit, run with it, man. I, I think that's I a, I think that's a great way to look at yeah. that. Yeah. I don't think you can yeah. send a single one of your beers to a contest and be stylistically appropriate. No, nothing we got on right now, but <laughs> that's okay. I sure. uh, at one point was a judge and so I can, I can do what I want now. Um, and then Definitely. you kind of mentioned, <laughs> uh, you kind of dived into Scott with Skyman and then Jimmy and him are going back and forth a little bit, but about the different generations of hot or yeast. And I think it just comes down to the different vari like varieties of yeast being more expressive versus less expressive. Sure. Yeah. And so like the Chico, I forget what Chico is called for them. What is that? Is that Star Party? Is uh, the Chico... Star Party is the Mexican. I think Chico might be the Helio Gazer. Uh, no, no Jimmy, Jimmy says that Star Party is, uh, Star Party Chico. is Chico. Yeah. I, just, I read this yeah. this morning. Sure. Yeah. You, you could, you could do, you could do uh, uh, either or kind of my gut would be you're, you're probably going to get like a little bit more of that, the English expression out of, uh, out of cosmic punch because, you know, because it is L3 at its roots. Um, and so maybe you can get some of that kind of traditional character, Esther character out of it, but then, you know, a, a, a nice little pop with something interesting on the fruit side as well. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cosmic Punch is the is the British five, and then uh yeah, Star Party is the is the Chico. Lunar Crush is the name of the Mexican lager one. That's then, right, Lunar Crush. Yep. And then Tuli mentioned maybe uh like a wheat beer uh wheat beer variety, like a fruity half might be. I think that's probably one of my more favorite uh, re- reasons to use that because a lot of times when I go into a half, I find myself wanting that hybrid between an American and a German style. I don't necessarily want a heavy sure. banana quote bomb, but something with a sure. little bit of that kind of American feel, uh, yeah. but with something else, some yeast kind of profile. So I could see that being one, yeah. of, the, one of the places I might like this kind of yeast. And that that might be fun. And 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 that a beer like that. Uh, a half grist would be something that would kind of naturally dial back the the intensity of that file expression yeah. because that that those that's one of the metrics where they'll say that if you're really looking to push thiols, you're probably going to go with with a lot more base malt you're going to want to cut back your wheat your oats that sometimes people see that want to load up with in these in these hazy style beers but but theoretically if you actually pull those pull those uh the the flaked wheat or, or, or flaked oats wheat out of that um you can actually get a little bit more thiol expression so if you're looking at something with a, a grist that's 50 percent wheat that's already one element that's kind of going to make that thiol uh that thiol contribution kind of pull back a little bit so maybe you can pull nice nuance and something like that yeah yeah and yeah. then uh that actually leads right into a question i thought about um is there a particular base malts that you know of that do better with thialized yeast that's one of the things that people that people got um that one of the uh the interview um that i listened to with uh dr laura burns and i think it was on it was a it was two ladies that have a podcast i'm brewing and i'm not going to remember uh the name but um god i I did false bottom girls Something like that. I think that's the name of it. Um, yeah. But uh, do you guys still have me, by the way? I'm just pulling up a screen on my computer. Yeah, yeah I always make sure. Okay, cool. Um, the on the uh, the escarpment site, they had an update in April 2022 where they said, based on user feedback, we do not recommending using North American Pilsner malts with. For them, it's called Thio Libre. Uh, Mm -hmm. as this increases risk of undesirable phenolics. We've had excellent results with North American pale malts as well as English base malts. So I I hate to give, I I hate to give an answer where it's like um, try it and find out, but it does seem as if we're still in that phase. Right. And so that was, that was one of the cool things. My, my buddy up North that has been running a lot of iterations of these, they just did basically, um, blonde ales 20 ibu different base malts and it was like it was like magnum at 60 like it wasn't anything so all they were testing was was the malt itself and they tried several different out and uh that's really where it's at with that um i know they liked they they really they're really encouraging people to try uh local maltster stuff for some reason but they don't want to talk about or at least i haven't read or listened to anything where they want to talk about explicit compounds in the malt that lend or like markers that we can look for to be able to to look at 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 a coa and be able to say okay this malt is going to be something i want to grab and use for this but that's probably going to be something that's emerging yeah, I, I was noticing that this one morning because I was trying to look at the same thing because if they recommend that you look into the effects of malts, but they're not giving a lot of details as to what you're looking for for the precursors. My sure. The general gist that I've gotten is under modified. It seems to be better for whatever reason. And then uh, mm-hmm. husk or husk-like mm-hmm. um, things that are on the malt seem to also be a, a factor. So if you've got a very... Uh, we used to have a triticale here that actually that uh, came with a very, very unique, overly chaffy kind of husk. My theory okay. would be something like that might be where you where you want to go with uh, getting thial precursors. And I have a feeling that, that the craft malt uh, conference that's coming up is they're probably going to talk some about this. Maybe because since it is the kind of forefront of brewing, like every brewer is talking about it. There's videos about it. We're mm-hmm. obviously talking about it. So that's interesting. So I mean, the, the, the first thing when you said that when you were talking about husk, the first thing I thought about was. Well, is there potential that six row would would have more, you know, because, you know, the, the kernels are smaller, so it's it's more husk to to to, to starch. Um, yeah. But yeah, anyways, that's that's interesting. 
So uh, it'd be a, uh, more for more for us to test out and find out. <laughs> right. <laughs> yep. Um, and uh, you mentioned kind of that the, your buddy up uh, uh, north of you was doing the blondes and stuff because Stephen mentioned a blonde ale that's uh, like a thigh old bomb mm -hmm. and stuff. So yeah. Um, and then uh, Jimmy mentioned any classic style, asked any classic style loggers that would work with this newer logger uh, E-strain or just newer stuff like cold IPAs. Mm. Um, I could see not necessarily like classic, but I can see certain like Pilsners maybe doing well with this. Like the, like since there's 30,000 different styles of Pilsner at this point in time, it feels well, like the emergence sure. of the, uh, the uh, New Zealand and the Italian Pilsners as styles where you're trying to go for a little bit more of a hop forward kind of feel. I can see this being, uh, that being one of actually probably one of my favorite new ways that we might see this being used. Yeah, I, I think it's a great application. Um, and, and that's, that's exactly the, my thought on that is, is just kind of think some of the, the newer school Pilsners um, mm -hmm. that, that you see out there and, and it, it even seems I was down in I was down in Austin drinking Pilsner down there and I and I was surprised by like it was it was a bitter beer, but it wasn't like it wasn't as bitter as some other Pilsners that I've had. You know what I mean? So it, it just seems like there's kind of this evolving uh, range of that style. You know yeah. what I mean? Um, and yeah, I, I think you could do some some I, I bet you can do some really cool things with that. I, I've had a couple of nice stylized lagers. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Well, if you, if you know of any that uh, make their way out here, let it, let us know. Send me a text. Be like, this one is one you got to try. For sure. This was pub stuff. I was up. Um, so this is when we were uh, when we were transitioning uh, ownership of uh, of the brewery. Uh, myself and some staff were, were up in Cleveland. And we went into a spot called Noble Beast, which was absolutely fantastic. Very cool little place. Great food. Uh, killer beer. And uh, yeah, they they had a they 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 don't distribute. They they're a pub, but uh, but yeah, uh, just shout out to them for uh, for some, say, nice, some follow, beers. I've been following them on social media for a while and just haven't had a chance to make it in. <laughs> nice. Yes, yeah, and super nice folks too. I, I had a chance to to chat with the ownership. They're very very nice people. Awesome. That's always fun when you can do that. Uh, I'm gonna put a, a a time limit on us just because I feel like we can nerd out about beer for forever. So let's say sure. nine o'clock our time, which I feel like that's like one of one a.m. your time. So you're probably probably good for you too. Now let's put a, a time limit on uh, closing out at nine, which is in about eleven minutes. And uh, okay. if anybody's got any questions between now and then, hit us up, and we'll we'll try to get those answered too. And then uh, Daniel put the thought out when we were talking about like husks and stuff, maybe adding rice holes. Yeah, I I don't I haven't seen anything on rat adding rice holes, and I don't know. Uh, I I feel like there might be some other quality in certain husks that make it so that rice holes wouldn't have naturally, because um, also rice holes don't provide tannin, and usually the things that I'm associating with tannin are the things that I'm associated <laughs> with, you know, thiol precursors. Um, okay, but this is just a broad guess in my brain right now, so I have no idea. Maybe rice holes wouldn't. And then Jimmy asked, what about, uh, we have a local malt company here, um, Link uh, Malt, um, which actually does a lot of heritage grains too. Mm -hmm. um, and they've actually brought back some grains that like were originally used for brewing, but then like die almost died out and then they've kind of nice. brought them back. Um, but Jimmy asked, but what about Link Spelt with the husk? That might actually work really well. Spelt's an interesting one. Yeah. It's like a wheat rye hybrid. I've, I've never touched Spelt. I, I've, I've never played with it at all. Yeah, uh, it's to say it's it was a wheat rye hybrid, but it does have husks. Of at least the last one that I had had husks in it. I don't really know why or where that comes from, but yeah, that'd be an interesting thing to try. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Or no, it's ancient wheat. It's ancient husky husked wheat. I don't. It's not. It's not the purple purple Egyptian. <laughs> yeah, which is the one I, the grain I would be like just most wanting to play with. Yeah, purple Egyptians are very a uh, protein heavy, under modified. Um, base grain that link has by the way if okay. you've ever been curious about purple egyptian barley that's a thing i didn't know about until link brought it up but it's a, it is a thing yeah i'm, I'm hearing about now for the first time <laughs> yeah so yeah um why waste money on hops when you can get the same flavor profiles from the yeast uh that's a good question i feel like uh we kind of talked about that a little bit at the beginning but uh, let's let's hear your take on it too but um i think somewhere the, the in between is kind of the somewhere uh, where uh, we think that there's some hop material that's going to be necessary for that natural beer sure. feel or IPA feel, but also this could maybe just be a new way to get more flavor rather than actually replacing the flavor that we're looking for. 
And, and I would say this, that the stuff that I've done, it, it does tend to express um, pretty explicitly as passion fruit. And that's, and that's great. Um, but there is, um, it's not like this, there's not a tremendous amount of nuance to it. And, but mm-hmm. that, that's not, to, I'm not saying it's artificial or anything like that, but it is that there's this, there's this to me, very pleasant passion fruit thing that, that rides through it. But it's, I, I would wonder if it would be too single note without having, without having some of the range, because, you know, I mean, as much as everybody wants these super tropical, you know, hops and everything like that, there's going to be, there's going to be a little dank, there's going to be a little bit of cannabis, there's going to be, you know, there's a whole range of flavors that you're pulling in there. And so I I, I think, ultimately, you might end up losing some on nuance, that would be my guess. Yeah. And also, I mean, same thing that could be said even for um, like using 100% cryo hops. I also feel like I miss a little bit of the green kind of material of just actually having, you know, pelletized or leaf hops too. Sure. Sure. That's something that without I miss. And that is, I mean, when I'm doing terpenes, that's kind of why I say that I, you know, I build a pale ale. It's got that hop base. But then when I'm doing terpenes, I can turn it into an IPA almost with with the extra extra kick of flavor. Definitely. Uh, yeah. Fremont Mischief Distillery made a whiskey with purple Egyptian barley. I think I swear it had a faint oyster flavor. I, Interesting. I think I I know that there is a distillery on the west side that Link works with very heavily. Probably. Fremont. I mean, given. Yeah. Uh, given well, that. I was gonna say I I, didn't, I don't think it was Fremont. I think there was another one. Well, but... M- Mischief is I think Mischief is oh. the name of the of the yeah. distillery, but. Yeah. Oh, that would make sense. But yeah. Um. Uh, Tyler B does malt freshness matter for thiols. Like our local brewery gets some super fresh local malts to use in the rest uh, recent thiol brew, and market it as higher thiol expression with uh, super fresh malts. So, do you think the age of malts has any, may, maybe has any, can something to do with thiol? It, it may, and it may have something to do with one of the reasons why they say you know look at local growers. Um, but that, that's that's just that's just a, a hunch there. But yeah, I mean, there there may very well be there, there may very well be something to that, and I think we're probably gonna we're probably gonna know more as we go. But that one might be a little too soon to know. Just coming from the uh, this is the non science part of my brain because this is definitely a science that I don't know. We've got monsters for that, and so I kind of put this out of my brain because it's their job to know this stuff, not mine. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, it, it stands to reason, like in my mind, that a lot of those fresh flavors kind of correlate with some of the tannic flavors. Um, you know, with with produce, you know, fresh bananas are certainly more tannic than ripe bananas and so maybe the sitting or they're just letting them store for a while starts to lower some of the those things that might also be precursors that's where my brain goes that's my that's my non-scientific sure guesstimate sure and and that might be a fun collab to do with uh the link malt guys Mm -hmm. do you guys have a, a local maltster that you use or work with over there there's there's a couple of folks. Um, there's somebody in Indiana. Um, I haven't used I, I haven't used much of it though. Now um, most of my stuff right now since we started after probably about a year and we started to make more and more lager. I just use I, I lean very heavily on uh, Barca Pills for uh, for the base of uh, my German stuff, um, and then pretty much everything else beyond that is like it's fruited beer or IPA. And so I'm just getting, yeah. I'm just getting base malt that is affordable and works well on my system. Yep. Uh, so that that's kind of where I'm falling on that. So, yeah, I, I would well, love to have it. It would be nice to have a pilot system just to be able to do some, some really malt trials would be great. I mean, that, that would yeah. be, that that would that would be excellent, but uh, but yeah, obviously you could try a lot of uh, plenty of things though. There's probably I think there's some more questions that are on the on the chat right now, but I kind of wanted to ask you, you know, since we're kind of getting close to wrapping things up, um, do you have a favorite malt, favorite hop, or favorite yeast? I mean, right now, I mean, I I love um, I love brewing with uh what well, would be harvest from imperial uh which okay. is their their lager strain i think that's the augustina strain i could be wrong I, I um, think but yes harvest right. i love it <laughs> har- harvest from harvest from imperial is is probably my favorite yeast on uh, in, in a lot of ways um just because uh super 
uh, super easy to work with as the the name maybe implies it's super easy to work with and harvest in the brew house it's dependable it's low sulfur it it, it doesn't it doesn't kick diacetyl it's it, it, it's really easy to work with and and you get a nice I I think you get a fuller malt expression off of that yeast than you do with uh with 3470 that could just be my opinion um but I absolutely love that uh I love that yeast um I do love the Barca line of uh of malts from uh from Wireman mm-hmm. um and uh yeah hop wise um I mean it's I, I think hops are one of like I, I've got buddies that can sit down and do a hop rub and, and, and they're not just like they're not just blown smoke either. Like they're they're, they're super good. They're, they're pulling out all this, that and that. And, and they can really see where that's going in the beer. Um, that's not that's not necessarily that's not necessarily my strength. Um, but I will say this, and this might be a, a kind of an, a, an unsexy answer. Um, I, I've really been enjoying making uh, Pilsner type beers. Um, we did a collaboration with 50 West where we did an Italian pills that featured a good amount of whether you I don't know if you pronounce it Calista Calista. Um, mm-hmm. uh, but we've used we've used that hop uh, as as a character hop as a whirlpool hop and some dry hop in an Italian pills. Uh, and and I like that, but that's just me all. That's just me talking talking lager because that's where my heart's at right now. So no, that's a hundred percent fair. Yeah, I like I like that answer too. Uh, Kalista is not one that would have crossed my mind, but it's uh, I actually I don't think I've brewed Kalista yet. Um, but that is a, I like that answer. Uh, it's got yeah, it's got a, li- a little noble feel to it, but a little something a little something extra. So yeah, right, yeah. Uh, how are we on questions? Any new questions before uh, we wrap things up? I was going to say the the major question I kind of saw was: Has anyone tried fresh hop versus pellets for the unleashed styles, and what's the difference? And I don't I don't know of anyone that's done experiments with that yet. Um, at Good least question. here in Washington, because we are like we have yeah. all the the fresh hop stuff. My guess would be pellets better. Yeah, but I would I that'd be interesting to do a uh, experiment with, during fresh hop season next yeah. year or this year. What do you think, fresh hops versus pellets for? Uh... Gosh, I, I I would I I would I wouldn't even know. I wouldn't yeah. even know on that. I, I, don't, I don't either. <laughs> <laughs> my, my guess is pellet, but I, I I don't have a reason for that. I'm just that's a it's a random guess. Yep. Sure. Now, all right. Let's. Uh, oh, have you tried any of the bark beyond the pilsner? I believe they have a Munich option. Is what Jimmy yeah, is. so they have they have Munich, and so when when uh, I know you guys were talking uh, Munich Dunkel earlier, I have a I have a Munich Dunkel that that does well for us, it's, and it's actually one one of my one of my favorite beers. Um, yes. And when I do that one, it's 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 Munich, it's it's Bark of Munich, um, uh, Bark of Pills, and some uh, some C or not C, Carafa uh, Special too. So yeah, they do have. They do have more in that Barca line as well. They're ta- they're tasty. I I for me personally because I do make a, a lot of yellow to golden uh, German lagers. Um, Barca Pills is a little less green to me or corny uh, yeah, yeah. to me than uh, than uh, the the standard uh, wine. Barca line. I'm not super familiar. Is that just a different grow or a different uh, breed of barley or? Yeah, it's 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 just a it's just a different breed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I it might might have a, a little bit of difference uh, modification wise, but but I find it just to be a little a, a little fuller and rounder and a little bit more expressive and less green. Okay, uh, all right. Uh, Stephen Plass asked, "Why would pellets be better?" And I, I I I told you straight up, I don't know. It's just a guess. <laughs> uh, why don't you Why don't you uh, finish this up by telling everybody where they can find you? What's the best place to uh, support you? Uh, yeah, best place is to check out uh, my YouTube channel, Adam Makes Beer. Um, I, I try to get a, a video out a day. Um, we have anything from full grain to glass uh, brew days in, in the brewery, and then we give recipe breakdowns at the end and tasting on the tutorials uh, for how I clean, uh, clean tanks, transfers, SOPs, stuff like that. And then uh, stuff like this, Q&A stuff and and yeah, so YouTube is really the best spot. If, if you love Instagram too, I'm also Adam Makes Beer on Instagram. Um, but most of most of Instagram is just pushing to YouTube. So, perfect. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Everybody, go support yeah. Adam uh, on Adam Makes Beer Instagram, YouTube, uh, all that. And now this is my first time ever live streaming from Zoom.